everybody. This is John Buck, back for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, today's video, we're going to introduce the Z-transform, uh, which is a generalization of the Fourier transform. And then I'll talk a little bit about the big picture of how it fits in the overall class to, to sort of uh, zoom back a little and, and, and think about that. Uh, but what, we've seen some really great uh, techniques with the Fourier transform, right? We've seen the Fourier transform lets us turn convolutions in time into multiplications in frequency. And we've also seen that by using the delay property that says if I shift a signal in time, I'm multiplying by a complex exponential in frequency, we were able to use that to turn difference equations directly into frequency responses that let us find impulse responses using the Fourier transform well. The problem is we found though is that we can't do those techniques for every signal, right? That there are signals who do not have a Fourier transform because their, their absolute sum does not converge. And similarly, although we haven't talked that much about it, in order to have a frequency response, the system has to be stable, right? I need the, the sum of the absolute value of the impulse response to converge, which was also the rule we saw back at the start of the class for an LTI system to be stable. So there are times we might want to think about uh, signals that don't have Fourier transforms or systems that aren't stable, uh, where we'd like to be able to use a lot of these very powerful techniques we've seen with the Fourier transform. And we say, wouldn't it be nice if we had a bigger wrench that did that? Like if the Fourier transform is a wrench that's this big, could we get a bigger wrench to do it? Uh, so that we can use a lot of the same techniques we've already used a lot of the same concepts. That bigger wrench is the Z transform. So it, it's a lot of the same concepts just for a broader class of signals. So let's see how it fits in the overall class and I'll show you some example, the definition and some examples of it. Again, so our topic today is the Z-transform, uh, and what we're going to, uh, if we think about this class in a certain sense, it's almost like a big spiral going up and around and around, uh, over and over again, looping back over the same type of topics, but covering them for a slightly different set of signals every time. So we could imagine that, that we sort of started out when we, got, we started thinking, once we got going with these basic ideas of LTI, but the first loop here is basically when we think about the Fourier series for periodic signals, right? So that said, these first ideas we had about how we could think about things instead of just purely in time, we could move to frequency, but initially we could only do it for periodic signals. We had to be able to find their Fourier series. But then we said, well, what, what if we do that more generally for a broader set of signals? The second loop coming back around is like the Fourier transform. A lot of the same ideas, a lot of the, you know, the idea about how do we think about filters and frequency? How do we use properties? But the, again, the issue here is we need to have finite energy signals, right? We need to know either the sum of the absolute value of x of n, or, right, so we either need the sum of x of n to be less than infinity, or if we're going to be willing to live with impulses and frequency, we can say the sum of x of n squared it has to be finite. But again, there are a lot of signals you can come up with where that doesn't fit. So today, we're, we're as we head to the end of the class, as we're spiraling our way from September to December, spiraling up, getting that bigger and higher ideas, um, we can look at this third loop, this third pass through the class is the Z-transform. And this is works for almost any signal. You have to sort of be some kind of mathematical evil genius to come up with signals that who don't have well-defined Z-transforms for the most part, and they don't happen in practice, in my experience. Um, and, and even if we sort of think about what's going on within these loops, if we use a little color here, we could say, well, one of the things that happened uh, as, as we were spiraling up each time is we had this section on filtering, right? This idea that how, how, how can we think about how the input of a, how the input and output of a system relate based on properties of the system. And at each level of the story, we're going to see that we, we talk about filtering a little bit. We're going to talk about how inputs and outputs relate based on properties of systems. And the other thing we'll see that, that shows up in each of them uh, that helps us with analyzing difference equations and other, uh, and also finding inverse transforms is properties. That we'll see very similar structure to the property story at each level as well. So that's sort of the big picture in one sense. Another way we could think of it, or some people find it helpful to think of it, uh, is in fact that, that it's sort of a, a, like a, 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 an expanding radius. So that we started with a small set of signals, which are periodic signals. And we said, those are really useful, helpful ideas to think about. 
but what if we could do it for a bigger family of signals? And so we did that, and we went to, to the, the finite energy signals. Right? And I should have labeled over here. So these periodic signals, again, just another image for this, as we started with the Fourier series. And then we went to finite energy. And so today, we're saying that was, again, really helpful. Let us turn a lot of complicated problems into uh, manageable problems when we were able to think about frequency. But what if we go to, to broader class of signals? So almost all discrete time signals fit in this, this final set. And again, so that's as we've gone from Fourier series to Fourier transform to the Z transform. Okay, so actually, you know, I think I'm going to stop this video here just with a sort of big picture overview. Uh, and then uh, on the next video, I'll talk about the definition and show some examples of the Z transform and how the Z trans, more precisely, how the Z transform relates to the Fourier transform. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.